There we go. So what I wanted to do, because I've been looking at this task list, like, like you should, I've been looking at this task list, trying to figure out what we need to cover for the rest of the semester. And one of the things it said was we need to talk about um, hybrid service. Now, while we're on this discussion of putting batteries in series, you know, a hybrid battery is like 400 volts. And since it's like 400 volts, you can't use typical service procedures on a hybrid, hybrid battery. In fact, you have to have all kinds of certified safety equipment and you're just asking for it because, you know, 400 volts uh, is, is a bad killer. In fact, um, it's got a 12 volt battery that we're familiar with and we know how to service and, you know, repair and, and uh, diagnose and stuff like that. But it's also got the, the main battery packs 400 volts. And not only is it not safe to service that or even come close to any of the conductors, but it's actually illegal. So um, you have to have not only the proper equipment, but you have to know how to test all this equipment pretty much every time you service it. Um, Cause you're dealing with a whole lot of voltage and a whole lot of voltage leads to a whole lot of amps. Uh, incidentally, if you're thinking about getting a big monitor for your computer, what the hell? How'd I get there? I don't know. Um, I'll tell you later. Come on. Right. There we go. No. Uh, okay, I'll find it. There we go. No, I thought I had it, but I don't. How about Prius service? Actually, it'd probably be hybrid. This is on the first page. Well, it says under engine repair, it says number seven, identify hybrid vehicle internal combustion engine service precautions. Now it's a P3, but the way hybrids are coming into their own, I don't think it's gonna be a P3 for long and I'm not convinced that it should be a P3. Um, now this does have, you know, we're supposed to be uh, creating entry level technicians and that's true, but I got to say, I think that it would be inappropriate to not give you at least a primer on how to uh, address these hybrid, um, hybrid cars safely. Let me try this. There we go. Right there. All right, check this out. Hi, I'm Mark Dinger with Garage Gurus. Today's tech tip is going to cover how to disable the high voltage electrical system on a hybrid or electric vehicle. There are a number of cases where service information will direct you to disabling the high voltage before working on components on the car. There are a number of different systems that require this type of disconnect. Since voltages run in excess of 300 volts, you need to follow these procedures exactly. In order to, do, to achieve this, you need to have the correct safety equipment as outlined in the service information. Be sure to follow all safety rules. Those gloves, for instance, are rated for a thousand volts. Their insulation is rated for a thousand volts. Before you put them on, you're supposed to fill them full of air and then roll them up by the cuffs because they got to hold air. If they have any pinholes, that's where electricity could get through. That they're, they're out. Then they've got these leather covers that you put over those gloves. It's like a, it's like a whole thing. So folks, don't just assume this is just like any other car and you can just go ahead and um, treat it like any other car. Even firemen, if they find a fire or any kind of significant problem with a hybrid car, first thing they're going to do is they're going to cut those 400 volt connections so that they don't get 
freaking wham because 400 volts DC is a sure stone cold killer. In order to explain the process, we need to touch on battery basics. The high voltage battery system is a fairly complex unit. The black outline represents what's in the battery case itself. Doesn't look complex. That was a joke. The red represents the actual battery pack. And there is a battery smart module, which communicates on serial data and identifies a number of different situations where the high voltage should be disabled. Serial data is the network, just so you know. Also, when 12 volts is disconnected from the battery smart module, either by shutting the key off or disconnecting the battery, the battery smart module automatically opens these two contacts inside the battery, and that disconnects the high voltage source from the actual output terminals. Hey, Jerry, have you ever changed the oil on a hybrid? Jerry, are you there? Chuck, you ever changed the oil on a hybrid? No, I can't say I come across it yet. Yeah, probably will. Hey, real clear. I what? did. I was working at a shop, and I forgot to put the grommet. Oops. It was a, it was a Toyota Prius. Right. I got fired for that. Were you wearing the proper safety equipment? Well, I was just doing the oil change. Yeah, but still, no, 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 no. You're supposed to be wearing the proper safety equipment. You can go get your job. They didn't back. care. Yeah, yeah. That was, like, that, was like 10, that was like 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay. That was before I met you. Aw, uh, you've known me more than 10 years, dude. I hate to tell you this, but you're getting old. This, this was like 12 then, like 12 years, like an old seven. Okay. All right. Maybe. I can't remember how long it's yeah, been. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know you at the time. That's why. That's why I took your class. That's why they called. That's why they called the good old days. For an additional level of protection, there is a disconnect switch, an orange switch on the outside of the case that you can pull, and this also interrupts the voltage from coming out of the battery case. This just gives you an additional level of protection in case the contacts in the relay were, were stuck closed. The basic disconnect process goes like this. You have the ignition key off and removed from the vehicle. That's important, folks, because if you leave that key on the inside, the fob could start the thing. Yeah, yeah, it's very dangerous. So, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole process, and you got to be really, really careful about this. When it comes to changing your own oil, if you own a hybrid or something like that, I would be kind of nervous about it. We disconnect the 12 volt battery. Now the 12 volt battery is just the 12 volt battery we've become used to in every car. So it's got a 12 volt battery, but that's not the main battery pack. That's the 400 volts. So, you know, the, the, other, the 12 volt battery, we can just diagnose service and repair just like we're used to on, you know, 65 Buick. We disconnect the orange service plug in the side of the high voltage battery and remove it with our voltage safety gloves on. Then we wait 10 minutes for all of the capacitors in the system to fully discharge. At that point, we follow the live dead live safety procedure to make sure that the high voltage system is truly disabled before we begin work. Let's go through the whole process and show you. The first step of our disconnect process will be to remove the ignition key or key fob from the vehicle and set it over on the workbench. Our next step is going to be to disconnect the 12 volt battery on the negative lead. So I loosen the nut and then push the cable out of the way so it can't accidentally touch. The next step will be to put the high voltage gloves back on.
and I'm going to pull the safety interlock off the battery case. So I pull it to the left and I pull it out. Then I'll set this over the workbench also. So it's completely out of the vehicle. The next step will be to wait 10 minutes before checking for voltage up front at the inverter. After 10 minutes goes by, then all the capacitors should be discharged and we should see zero volts. Right before going up front to check that though, what we want to do is verify that our voltmeter works correctly. So I'll touch the leads across the 12 volt battery and I get 12.2 volts. This verifies that my voltmeter leads are good, the meter is on the right scale, and I'm ready to do that test up front. I'm removing the last bolt, holding the power inverter electrical cover in place. But now the high voltage battery has been disconnected by taking out the interlock. So this should be safe, but he's gonna check. Oh, incidentally, you know what that is right there? What? Is that the uh, expansion tank? And that's the brake fluid? See how clean and bright pink the coolant is when it's new? Brake I believe that's brake fluid back there. See, brand new brake fluid is golden clear, not the dark brown crap we have. <laughs> <laughs> I remove the cover and that gives me access to the high voltage terminals underneath. What I'm going to do is take the voltmeter that I verified its function on the 12 volt battery in back, and I'm going to test for voltage on the two high voltage terminals. So I touch across and I should show zero volts. Now I reverse the polarity of the leads and check again. And again, if I get zero volts, that shows me that the high voltage system has been disabled and the system should be safe to work on. But as part of my live dead live process, I'm going to go back and verify that this meter is still working. After verifying that I show zero volts on the inverter connections up front, I wanna make sure that my digital meter is still reading accurately. So I'm going to touch the They're leads scared. across the 12 volt battery just like before. By showing the 12.2 volts, that verifies that my leads are good, my meter was set on the correct scale, and I'm now safe to work on the high voltage system. I'm Mark Ingram with Garage Gurus. Thank you for watching. See, these guys are terrified. And this is all OSHA too, so it's not like, it's not like you have a choice in the matter. If you don't do it the right way and somebody gets hurt, hell, he'll own your shop by Friday, right? So, so whether you're an employee or an employer, you need to make sure that this is done to the T. And what you're going to see next is there's a whole bunch of equipment that you need to make sure that you got right there. Check out this equipment you have to have your safety, equipment. Safety, safety, safety. Don't work on a hybrid vehicle unless you've had the proper training and own the proper equipment. Now, everything that's orange in color is high voltage. Stay away from it unless you've been specifically trained and you have all this hardcore equipment because this is not something to mess with. It's not worth dying from. Before we even get into the meter aspect, let's talk about gloves, because anytime you handle a meter or tools around these orange cable connections, you've got to have class zero 1000 volt gloves. And I have to have a set right here. Keep them in this canvas bag to keep them protected between uses. And every time I get them out, I'm going to inspect them visually and then perform a little test to see if they hold air. You can blow in them or you can roll them up 
And if they hold air, there's no pinholes. If there's a pinhole, a flashback problem with the electrical system on a hybrid could actually find its way into that pinhole to your hand. So each time you put a set of gloves on, check them. And every six months, they recommend you send them off for professional testing. So we'll go ahead and roll that up. And it holds air. Now, the rubber gloves protect you, and the leather shells protect the gloves. So we'll put these on and continue talking more about safety in hybrid vehicles. Safety glasses aren't a bad idea either in any kind of auto repair realm, especially working with the high voltage systems. So once I've got class zero gloves on, let's talk about category three meters. Now, most of the Fluke's products are category three now, the five series, 87s, 88s, they're all category three. And of course, this Fluke 1587 high voltage insulation tester, also cat 3000 volt meter. You can find the rating of that meter down here in the lower right hand corner of all the products. No matter what brand of meter it is, it will say whether it's cat 3000 volts or not. This cat stands for category. We cat 3000 volts and cat four 600 volts. So make sure not only the meter is specified to that degree of protection, but also make sure the leads say 1,000 volts, as well as the ends, the alligator clips or probes. So hardcore stuff, not stuff to be messed with um, um, by, you know, people are just kind of fooling around. <clears throat> it's not that kind of party. All right. Oh, so, what? So, Chuck, have you been watching the videos on like the uh, um, Power Probe hook and the Power Probe four? I mean, I looked at them uh, about six months ago. Yeah, the hook looks really, really hardcore, but it's really big, and I'm wondering if that would be a, an issue. But well, no. what cat well, what category is that going to fall under now? What do you mean? Well, is that going to fall under the category four? Oh, shoot, the power probe? I don't think so. I mean, the power probe. Oh, well, I'll tell you, the new power probe four goes up to 200 volts. So it's actually useful for, you know, houses and small businesses, okay. AC and DC. So, I, I mean, I'll be interested in seeing. I haven't watched, like, one of these 30-minute videos on it, but I saw, a, like, a 15-minute video on it, and it's a significant upgrade from the three. Yeah. It's not something I would want to learn on if I was first learning how to use a power probe, but it looks good for the next step. I don't know how much you use it, but, you know, if you're working on cars all day long, you probably use it all the time. It's got nice features, like it'll do uh, fuel injectors and stuff like fuel injector pulse and stuff like that. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, we, all we can do is try. So, uh, it says, identify hybrid vehicle internal combustion engine service precautions. You need to stay the hell away from that high voltage. Now, um, I would be very, very careful about this uh, hybrid service. Now, let me tell you something because it's useful to know. I mean, you saw what happened with this Audi Q7 and the diesel particulate filter, right? I'm to I told you don't buy a freaking European import, but I think he had it before he joined the class. Now, I was talking to my friend yesterday when I went out to beautiful Logan's. Uh, I was talking to my, friends yet, my friend yesterday, and he's like, well, my wife wants to get an Audi. I'm like, dude, no, 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 no. He said, I like the Acura. I'm like, yeah, get the Acura. Now, of course, Michelle, I'm hoping the Acura will send me a car just so I can demonstrate how big it is. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, they'll send me a car so I can show everybody how much better than an Audi it is. Um, I'm sure it is. Yeah, I'm not, not getting a car from Look Audi. Look at the new ones. They're so pretty, those new Acuras. Really? Yeah, they're really pretty cars. Yeah. I mean, I can't really tell them apart from the distance. The Acura, the Legend, or, I mean, the Lexus, I mean, all that stuff. But, you know, that's not my, that's not my niche market. Um, <clears throat> that's, um, so, when you're working on a hybrid, folks, I'm, not, I'm going to suggest to you that this is maybe something that you don't want to do go you don't want to dip too far into it um because it's going to take a significant um investment in equipment look how long does a battery last in a car 
in a hybrid car? Or uh, any period, car? period. Like five years? Five, seven years, yeah. Which is why if you start looking for hybrids, you're gonna find that the five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-olds are gonna be really, really cheap. And you're gonna say, oh man, I can get this car so freaking cheap. Yeah, but guess what? The battery costs a fortune. Sometime within a year, yeah, it's like $3,000 to change out that high voltage battery. Yeah. Um, so, well, it's like the, the clutch in the Z06 is like, yeah, right? Uh, it's like the clutch in the Z06, that, that clutch job is like four or five grand which is why I'm not letting my friends drive it and see, you know, how big of a freaking, how fast they can do a quarter mile. Cause it's like, I ain't trying to spend $5,000 to replace the clutch in that car. You know, I'm going to treat it like a little baby and yeah. I'll probably do enough damage to it that way. <laughs> um, okay. So next one, lubrication and cooling systems. Number one, it says perform cooling system pressure and die tests. To identify leaks, check coolant condition and level, inspect and test radiator, pressure cap, coolant recovery tank, and heater core, determine necessary action. And I wanted to talk to you a bit about testing of the cooling system because the cooling system is an absolutely essential part of uh, the car, which can basically make or break having this car being something you want to keep or something you need to get rid of. So cooling system, what does it do? It draws away all this insane amount of heat from the engine, uh, at least it better. So what do we need to know about coolant? Well, what do we need to know about coolant is especially that it turns acidic when it gets old. How often are you supposed to change it? Well, at least every five years, at least every five years. Nobody ever does, but you need to. And how do you know when it's old? You know when it's old because it's not bright anymore. We saw that bright pink. It's not when it's not bright, when it's dirty, when it's dirty gray pink, mm -mm. when it's olive drab instead of bright green, no. When it's, you know, dirty orange instead of bright orange, you know, all the different colors that coolant comes in, you, you can tell a lot by just looking at it. But you can, of course, use a pH test, you know and test for acidity, stuff like that. There's uh, refractometers that people use um, to get really scientific about the coolant, but usually in my experience, we don't have to get that scientific. If you're working at a dealership, well, yeah, we could look at service records or something like that, but I'm not gonna spend a ton of time doing diagnostics on the coolant uh, because usually it's way over. You can tell this coolant's never been changed in a 12-year-old car. Okay, it's time. I know that. I don't have to test it. I'm, I'm just getting rid of it. I'm just replacing it. Um, hmm. Let's get this over here. Excuse me. There we go. Yeah, so that's my theory on that. Um, you can test it for acidity with using a pH strip or something like that. Um, that's fine. Um, you can test it visually looking for, you know, oil. What does oil look like when it mixes with coolant? White. It's getting a little bit white. Really yeah, white. it turns into like a milkshake. A yeah. Bit. So if you've got pink coolant and it looks like a strawberry milkshake on your radiator cap, that's a bad sign. Bad sign. So that's one of the things you want to check if you're going to buy a used car. That's one of the things I'm going to check. I'm going to check the radiator cap and I'm also going to check the oil filler cap. Now, if someone doesn't change the thermostat, I mean, sorry, if someone removes the thermostat and doesn't put it back in, yeah, you're going to have a lot of sludge and, and, and deposits and stuff like that in your crankcase, uh, your oil system, your oil reservoir, whatever, which can kind of fool you. Or if someone hasn't started this engine in a long time, it can have a lot of condensation, which can kind of fool you, but usually if you got a head gasket or a cracked head or block issue, it's going to look bad like a milkshake and you need to run. Because sad to say, I mean, there are terrible people that will, will burn you hard on that issue. Incidentally, while we're on the topic, are you aware that in the state of California, the seller of any motor vehicle is required to 
make sure to, to make any repairs necessary to get a vehicle to pass emissions inspection that they sell. The seller is liable. So there's only one way to get out of it. And most people don't know that way. If you put as is sale, that does not protect you from that requirement. In the state of California, the seller is liable for any repairs, any expense necessary to get this vehicle to pass emissions. If you want to get out of that, if, for instance, you're selling a frame or you're selling an, a vehicle with a known bad engine, you need to put will not pass emissions inspection on the bottom. It has to be there. And if I was you, here's how I do it. When I'm buying or selling a car, I got this amazing device that has a camera on it. I learned this from Mar Marilyn Million. This has a camera on it, and I'm going to take pictures of everything. I'm going to take pictures of everybody's driver's licenses. I'm going to take pictures of everybody's insurance. I'm going to take pictures of everybody's registrations. And I'm going to take pictures of every document that's filled out, including the release of liability, right? So that I have all these things in my records. So that if I lose the paper or something comes back at me, I can say, yeah, you know what? Here's proof. I, I, I filled out the release of liability. You know, if he gave me the wrong information, it's not going to be on me, right? Because, well, take for instance, the release of liability. Every time you sell a vehicle, you're required by California law to uh, submit a release of liability form within five to 10 days. Well, I'm going to do it that night, right? I'm going to do it online. I'm going to do it that night. But as long as a release of liability is not submitted, if this person drives your car that's still registered in your name and kills a bunch of people, you're liable for that. You need to be aware of that. So release liability, I'm going to do it, you know, as the, as the car pulls out of the drive, if I'm selling a car, as it pulls out of my driveway, I'm going to be running in and getting on the DMV computer and filling out the release of liability before something bad happens that comes back at me. Um, so now if somebody wanted to sell me an engine with a blown head gasket and they ripped me off and it was obvious that they ripped me off, they misrepresented their product. Well, you know, misrepresenting your product, that's a hard thing to prove because everything is assumed to be an as is sale. And you can't always guarantee that the judge is going to understand California's emissions control law, like, you know, the seller's liable for any expense necessary to get the vehicle to pass inspection. But what you can do is you can do it, you can go after it from the uh, Bureau of Auto Repair route, which is to say, you know what, dude, you need to understand, if this car won't pass smog, I have recourse. And you know what, I'll put a, I'll put a freaking, basically a new engine in it, and you'll pay for any emissions control system that needs to be fixed. And you know what, you're going to find out that it's going to cost you more than you've made out of me, right? It's going to cost, I mean, say for instance, some 1985 Honda Civic with 260,000 miles on it, right? To get that thing to pass smog if it's blown a head gasket would be worth, would be way more than the car would be worth after you were done. So keep that little thing in your toolbox because that's, uh, keep that little tip in your toolbox because That'll keep you from getting victimized and you need to tell everybody you know so that they don't get victimized as well. Or they don't do something stupid like sell a car thinking that, oh, well, I told the guy that it had a blown head gasket. Mm, that doesn't release your liability. You have to write on the bill of sale, will not pass emissions testing. And you know what I'm going to do after I do that? I'm going to get him to sign it and I'm going to take this little device right here and I'm going to take a freaking picture of it. Yeah. Because this, oh, you know, I told him I had a blown head gasket. No, no he didn't. Uh, but you know, people, you would be surprised to find out, but people sometimes don't tell the truth. Um, so that's that. Now, there is a test on the coolant that I wanted you to know about. It's called block check. Has it got a C, a second C, block check? And what the block check does is it uses a special fluid that is reactive to combustion gases. And what you do is you put it on top of the radiator like this. 
and you've got this little block check apparatus right here with your special fluid in a secondary chamber. Little bulb like that, like a turkey baster. I think I'll probably show you the video. It's got the special fluid in here that's reactive to combustion gases. And what you're going to do is you're going to have the engine running. You're going to pull air from the top of the radiator into this chamber and see if the liquid changes colors. If it changes colors, that shows you that there's combustion gases present in the cooling system, which tells us what, Chuck Reina? A blown head gasket or a cracked head. Blown head gasket, cracked head, cracked block. Yep. Yep. It's called block check. I don't think it has a second C. But I believe there's videos on that that you can watch. I don't know whether we should spend our time doing it, but uh, well, slowly but surely we're getting here. Where's well, there's a whole bunch of good students missing. They not know we were having class tonight. Or? I don't know. All I can tell you is we only got three classes after this, so let's make the most of it. Let's make sure you get your money's worth. Um, now, the key to the block check is you can't suck fluid into this because that's bad. Don't suck fluid into this chamber. That's why we need to have a little bit of space on top of the coolant so that we can just suck in the uh, air. And if you have combustion gases in the coolant, it'll show up in the radiator, at the top of the radiator. Yeah, you know what? That's true. They buy it without titles. And I got to tell you, that's a huge mistake. Because what I found, Gloria, and this is terrible, and I'm glad you brought that point up. A lot of people do this thing called skip title, which is, which is illegal. Skip title means that I bought a vehicle from Michelle, but I didn't register. Oh, there you go. Good. Skip title means, well, then we probably already know each other. Um, skip title means I bought a vehicle from Michelle, but I didn't register it in my name, and I sold it to Chuck. That's called skipping title, and that's illegal. Now, the problem is, I, the last time I tried this was with a freaking, well, I'm, I'm not going to admit to a crime on tape. So, I heard about this guy who actually did this with a car he bought, and he thought it was only skip title once, but it turns out it was skip titled twice. So now not only do you have to find the, the guy that sold it to you, but you have to find the guy that sold it to him, and you got to have all kinds of registered letters, and this could take months and months and months, and what if you can't find the person? What if they moved out of state? Don't, just don't. You know, that's why I say, Gloria, if I'm going to buy a vehicle, the title better be perfect. Perfect. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Because what you find out is that the often, if you, if you try to go without the title thing, you, you find out that the person who's selling it to you doesn't have the legal right to sell it. For instance, you can find out that they went to a title loan company, went to a title loan company, and there's still a lien on the car. Yep. Yep. So if the paperwork is not perfect, I say it's not worth it. It's so not worth it. You know, there's so many nice cars out there. We got to not get all excited and just do stupid things like that, that, you know, and then you end up buying, you know, you end up spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get the, just to get the title right. Now that, you know, you could have bought a nicer car. And hours, yeah, I it, I, oops, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hours and hours at the DMV as well, waiting in line right. time and time again. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, be, because there's only so much the auto club can do. And, and when they see this big old title issue, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, sorry, we can't handle this. You got to go to the DMV. Now you're spending hours and hours at the DMV. It's like, what the, you know, how many hours can you spend at the DMV before, you know, it, you know, gets a thousand dollars worth of labor time. And it's not a pleasant day. I mean, you know, now, now your boss is looking at you weird because you took the day off. So, yeah. So, you don't want to have paperwork problems. I think I think actually that's one of the things you missed um, in the first couple of weeks because we were talking about the process of buying and selling vehicles. So yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you pointed that out because it's a huge mistake and and this title skipping thing is bad. I'll tell you the other title thing that you got to worry about. You know that's interesting. I have to ask you. Not only there's 
sometimes there's lien holders on the titles. Yeah. Which is why the the titles are not being given to the individual and the dealerships have closed or the finance companies have closed. That becomes a big, big deal in itself. <laughs> It's just, it's just a major problem. Yeah, you're cutting out now, Gloria. But I just wanted to say, yeah, I mean, that's the major reason. See, a lot of people say I lost the title, but that's not true. What happened is they signed it over to, to the title loan place or the pawn shop, or whatever, and they haven't satisfied the loan or they got the pink slip back. But since it's already filled out, um, they haven't uh, applied for a duplicate pink slip. So it's like that becomes your nightmare at that point. Like, it's not, it's not, not worth it. Ain't no car worth that. So my suggestion is don't do this paperwork problem. I mean, you're going to have, you're going to have enough problems when you put the car up on the rack and you find out it needs a rack and pinion or it needs half shafts or, you know, you're going to have plenty to keep you busy. You don't have to be doing a bunch of paperwork. Now, I did want to th come up with a uh, theoretical question that I think is really, really important. My question to you is, if there is a head gasket leak between the cylinder and the coolant passage, will coolant go into the cylinder or will combustion gases go into the coolant? Coolant will or go into the cylinder. Or if there is a leak between an oil passage and a coolant passage, will the oil go into the coolant or the coolant go into the oil? This is now we got to think about this because this is this is a interesting question. Now you say, well, you know, oil pressure is you know 60 psi max. When's the only time you have oil pressure? When the car's running. When the car's running, right? And it's only going to be 60 psi when it's cold in the morning. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and you can go to the DM, you can go to the very helpful DMV website, and you can see how much it's going to cost to register a vehicle. That's that's actually a very helpful uh, site. So, I mean, things are so much better than they used to be. It used to be you just go down to the DMV and hope that things aren't terrible for you. Now you now you kind of got at least a chance. Okay, so. Oil. Oil is 60 PSI, but that's maximum, and that's at high RPM when the engine's cold. So at lower RPM, the oil pressure is going to be lower. When the engine heats up, the oil pressure is going to be lower. When the engine's not running, the oil pressure is going to be zero. Remember, we know that pressure always goes from high to low. Let me write that down. Pressure always goes from high to low. All right, let's talk about the coolant then because the oil seems like it's complicated. So let's talk about the coolant. Well, the coolant is 15 PSI max when the engine's hot, all the way hot. Okay, what about when the engine's not hot? Well, what's the coolant what's the coolant pressure in my radiator right now in my Z06 that I haven't driven all day? What's the coolant pressure? Zero. Yeah. So this is gonna vary too. So this is gonna vary. And that's gonna vary. Because a lot of times people are going to be very simplistic about this and they're going to miss the subtlety of the question. All right, so let's say combustion chamber, that's inside the engine. Well, what's the pressure in the combustion chamber? During the power stroke, it's probably 25,000 PSI. During the compression stroke, it's 150. During the exhaust stroke, it's probably 60. But let me ask you a question. What's the pressure during the intake stroke when the piston's coming down with the intake valve open? What's the, what's the pressure, Chuck? Negative. It's negative. That's right. Yeah. So it's actually a suction. Mm -hmm. It goes from suction 
to, I don't know, 25,000 PSI? It's not going to be 25,000 PSI for long. I'd break everything. But so the problem is all these pressures vary. So the question of what's going to go in where is kind of complicated. And that's why we want to use the block check because we're looking for, you know, as long as this pressure is higher than this pressure, this is going to blow into that. But let's turn off the engine. Now, how much pressure do I have in my combustion chamber? Zero. How much pressure do I have in my oil system? Zero. Zero. But I still got my coolant pressure because it's still hot. So now this 15 PSI is going to go into the crankcase. It's going to go into the combustion chamber if it has a chance. See? It's kind of subtle. Mm -hmm. So. That's why we're going to do block check, and that's why we're going to do a visual inspection to see if we can get some kind of hints. Um, now, I'm just inspired right now because I want to address something while I'm thinking about it. Automatic transmissions. This is another subtlety thing that a lot of people don't uh, catch. And I've never seen it addressed anywhere before, anywhere elsewhere. Automatic transmissions have coolers in the radiator. All of the stock, not racy ones do, have actually oil coolers in the radiator. Do those ever leak? Sure, especially if you let your coolant become acidic. Feel me? The rubber gets messed up. No, it? it's it's not rubber. It's like it's like a copper or aluminum tank inside inside one of the tanks on the side of the radiator. Because the automatic transmission fluid gets so hot that it actually gets cooled down by the antifreeze by the engine coolant. Mm -hmm. The problem is when that tank springs a leak, now what you'll do is you'll get uh, oil in your coolant, which makes you think you have a blown head gasket, but you don't because that little tank has sprung a leak. Now, here's the thing. Which is higher, the transmission pressure or the coolant pressure? Again, well, it depends. It depends on what time it is, right? Because, you know, the, the, the trans cooler pressure is probably 30 PSI. When? All the time? Oh. Right now? When you're driving? Yeah, the only time the transmission, the uh, only time the automatic transmission is going to have pressure is when the pump is turning. The only time the pump is turning is going to be when the engine is turning. So... As long as your as long as your engine is running, the pressure in your little coolant, your little oil cooler is going to be higher than the coolant. So if there's any leaks, the transmission fluid is going to go into the coolant. Okay, shut off the engine. Now what? Now you still got 15 psi in your radiator, but you got zero psi in your trans cooler. So and as a result, it's going to push water and coolant into your trans cooler. And as soon as that gets in your automatic transmission, and it be, you got to realize all the clutches in the automatic transmission are made of paper. Oh, yeah. So what do you think is going to happen when that water comes into contact with the paper? It destroy it. It completely destroys your transmission. And if you're not careful, what you're going to do is... You're going to go to one of these cheap shops because transmissions are so expensive, right? You're going to go to one of these cheap shops down in our local area, and they're going to take out the old transmission, and they're going to put in a rebuilt transmission for you. And guess what? Same thing's going to happen. Same thing's going to happen. Why? Because you're not addressing the problem. Because you're not addressing the problem. You didn't fix the radiator. Yeah. Yeah. And it does not take much water to completely destroy an automatic transmission. And that's a very sad tale that I need to tell you because... I got to tell you, I mean, automatic transmissions themselves are horrendously expensive. I mean, they're like $2,000 $2, without the installation. 
Wow. That's for rear wheel drive. It's way more than that for a front wheel drive, unless you can get Chuck to do it for you. <laughs> so my point was, that's a sad tale, but yeah, not only do you have to replace the radiator in that case, but you also have to flush the lines because you need to get all that water out of that system before it attacks the paper clutches. And you say to yourself, how is it possible that a transmission in a you know 4,000 pound, three quarter ton truck has paper clutches? I don't know, but it works. Probably because they're you know saturated with oil. It works though. I mean, it's been working for a long time. So the reason I bring this up is because I wanted to talk to you about this question of, well, you know, we, we say to ourselves, oh, trans pressure is 30 PSI. It's always going to push into the rate. And no, all of these pressures vary depending on operating conditions. So one of the things I need to point out, though, is that if you've got a transmission cooler inside a radiator that's pumping oil into the radiator, let me ask you a question. When you put the dipstick on the automatic transmission, what are you going to find out? Milky. It's going to be low. If it's pushing oil into the cooling system, the trans fluid level is going to be low, right? If if I have if if I have a low level of engine oil or transmission fluid, this is a good this is a really powerful discussion. If I have a low level of engine oil or transmission fluid, you know what, that went somewhere and I need to be extraordinarily interested in finding out where it went. For instance, engine oil. Engine oil can only go two places. It either disappears inside the engine or it disappears outside the engine. If it's outside the engine, we'll know how. Mm, smell? It'll smell. show up on your driveway. Oh yeah. Yeah, if you're losing oil Outside of the engine, it'll show up on your driveway or your friend's driveway or your landlord's. Now, if you're losing oil inside the engine, let me ask you a question. If you're losing oil inside the engine, where is it going to go? Well, it could be going to the cooling system, but you probably ain't going to notice that much. If you're losing oil into the combustion chamber, where's that oil going to go? This is, this is big medicine. Where's it going to go? Out the tailpipe. It's gonna get. It's gonna go out the tailpipe. But what's it gonna meet before it gets to the tailpipe? Cats. Yeah, it's gonna hit your cats, right? And it's not gonna be combustible. Is that a cat killer? Potential cat killer? Yeah. Yeah. All day long, buddy. All day long. Yeah. That's why you know everybody's talking about. Oh, let's buy this car with two hundred thirty thousand miles. I'm like, you know, it's just like you're you're spinning that barrel and pulling that trigger, and you know, one of these days. So, I wanted to talk to you about these things because I've never seen these issues addressed anywhere else before, and I think it's absolutely crucial what we just spent the last hour or so talking about. Absolutely crucial because what it does is it forces us to take our theoretical understanding and actually apply it in a pretty abstract way and that that's i mean that's really powerful look if i have an automatic transmission and it's losing fluid it's losing fluid somewhere and if it's not losing it on the ground it could be losing it in the lines but that would end up on the ground or it's losing it in the freaking cooler inside the radiator tank which is a disaster waiting to happen if you don't catch that almost right away I'd say this car is probably junk and the transmission needs to be replaced before it leaves you on the side of the road. Let me show you what So what are you going to do with cars without no dipstick, the newer ones? Right. See, I was thinking about that too. Are you talking about for the engine oil or the trans fluid? A lot of these new trinies don't have dipsticks. Right. I guess they don't really care or they're not worried about that. That's your problem, right? Okay, as you can see, like for instance right here, you've got a transfluid cooler inside your, oh, sorry, you got a transfluid cooler inside your radiator. That's what these two lines are for. You're gonna see that on an automatic transmission car and you're not gonna see it on a manual trans car. 
Sometimes you'll see the lines, but they're not going to be hooked up on a manual trans car. It's just because they only make one radiator. So, oh, ASCCertificationTraining.com. Hmm, never been there. Might have to take a second look. And that's what it looks like. See, it's got the line coming in, like line going out. This is a plastic radiator. Well, it's got plastic tanks on an aluminum core. What do we think about plastic tanks on an aluminum car, Chuck? They're going to break for sure sometime. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you know how I feel about parts, man. If this thing's got 170, 180,000 miles on it, I'll throw one of those on all day long. I'm not going to get some high-performance blah, blah, blah radiator because I'm not probably not going to have this car for 50,000 miles. At least it better last 50,000 miles. So... It's just now this is this is an external trans cooler line that you're often going to see at the front of a vehicle. You see this a lot on like uh, rally cars and stuff like that. That's what it's doing. But the failure rate on this is so huge that I mean I think the Z06 has one of these. In fact, it has an engine oil cooler and a it actually has a differential oil cooler. I'm just saying. But, you know, there's a price to be paid for that. That's one mount for, you know, trans cooler stuff. But um, that's pretty much what it looks like, folks. Little cooler like that. And it's got these lines that are actually screw in flared ends. Uh, Chuck, what are we using on those threads? To screw in the, pardon? Teflon tape. That is correct. I agree. Good. I agree. Good, 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 good. So I wanted to talk to you about the trans cooler because after all, if we find oil in the coolant, if we find oil in the radiator, coolant, whatever, it's not necessarily just the engine. If we find oil in the coolant, we, we would expect that the engine oil level would be down. But engine oil consumption is not uncommon. Automatic trans fluid consumption is. Hmm, back in the day. Old school, Chuck. Remember back in the day when automatic transmissions had the vacuum modulator on the back and the oh, diaphragm yeah. would go bad and it yeah. starts sucking the fluid out? Fords used to have them. Yeah, everybody. Uh, back in golden, golden olden days, stuff only dinosaurs remember. And that oil cooler remind me of uh, getting a B&M transmission cooler at the super shop. Right, yeah, yeah, on Azusa and, Azusa and San Bernardino Road or whatever it was. Yeah, super shop, what the hell? Yep, so that's what it looks like. Um, that's the fitting right there. A lot of times they'll have an adapter like that for smaller stuff. That's actually a quick disconnect, right? Do you have quick disconnect uh, tool fittings? Let me look. Quick disconnect tool. Yeah, these are the cheap ones. This is the Harbor Freight oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, those, yeah, I have some of those. I mean, for a while there, I mean, the manufacturers have kind of fallen in love with the quick disconnect. Yeah. So, hey, you don't know anyone who uses Bosch uh, 18 volt uh, power tools, do you? Yeah, I went to the pawn shop and I got like this battery because it's like red and I was like, oh, great. So now I got a spare battery for my freaking Milwaukee stuff. I got it home and I looked at it and it says Bosch on the side. I'm like, God damn it. that's what happens when you get too excited. <laughs> well, that's not kind of what I'm looking for. So how about quick disconnect fuel line. Fuel line. There we go. All right, so the manufacturers kind of fell in love with this quick disconnect stuff. And basically what it has is, I was hoping, see, that's what it's gonna look like. It's got a spring right here that's gonna hold yep. this little shelf in. So when we come in with these tools, what we're doing is we're spreading the spring so that the shelf will come out. Actually, 
got a step by step here. If you want to say how to work with late model quick disconnect fuel lines, hot, hot rod network. network. Um, so the manufacturers kind of went into uh, quick disconnects uh, in a real way. Is that going to help us? Mm. Maybe squeeze those. Yeah. So um, lots to think about. I mean, modern cars. It's got an O-ring, so they like that. And the screw, the screw, uh, the screw tight connectors, the the flare nut fittings. Um, people were messing those up because they weren't using uh, flare nut wrenches. They were just using open end wrenches or crescent wrenches or vice grips. So, um, lots of new technology in the newer cars. So we got to keep up with the game or just, you know, say I only work on stuff that's older than 68 or whatever. Uh, this right here is the steel braided line we were talking about when we were talking about brake lines. Um, it's far superior when it comes to uh, protection from impact damage. Problem is it's very hard to inspect the, well, it's pretty much impossible to inspect the rubber hose that's on the inside. In case you're wondering how the steel braided holds pressure, it doesn't. It's just a coating for a, a, a rubber hose. And it makes it impossible to inspect because it's got steel braided all over it. So just something to think about. Like I said at the time, 723, like I said at the time, the problem is when those rubber hoses react to uh, petroleum products, they swell. And what happens is they swell on the outside and they also swell on the inside. So the hole gets smaller. Now, when you step on the master brake cylinder, I just want to repeat it because it's a diagnostically important. When you step on the, on the brake pedal and the master brake, master brake cylinder puts out 3000 PSI or the ABS puts out like 15,000 PSI, plenty of pressure to apply the caliper. But the thing is what retracts the caliper, what retracts the pads off of that rotor is only the deflection of the seal on that piston. That can't create pressure, hardly any pressure at all. Or maybe the return springs on the drum brakes, that can't, that can't create hardly any pressure at all. So what happens is once the hose swells, the master brake cylinder can create that pressure, but then the pressure can't get back to the master brake cylinder. There's not enough force. So Look, I know that there's a lot of people that say, you know, brakes is the easiest part. That's the first thing you should do. It seems to me it's kind of a nerve wracking thing to be experimenting with. Um, but, you know, when it comes, there's, there's, you can do brakes all day for years and years without understanding how the system works. You know, if you want to find out if someone's a real mechanic, ask them what a proportioning valve does or a metering valve. Blah, 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 blah. You'll hardly find anyone that knows what a proportioning valve does that didn't go to school for it. Okay, I'll tell you what a proportioning valve does on every truck that I'm aware of. We've got five minutes, so we got time. On every truck that I'm aware of, the newer stuff it has a height sensing proportioning valve. Proportioning valve means how much brake pressure goes to the front brakes, how much pressure goes to the back brakes. And it's especially an issue with pickup trucks because, well, trucks, because trucks can be unloaded, completely unloaded, or they can be completely weighed down. So if you apply the same brake pressure to the back brakes at all times, it's going to skid when it's empty and it's not going to give you any braking when it's full. So these vehicles have a height sensing proportioning valve, which is to say it senses how high the bed of the truck is in relationship to the usually the rear differential and that's how it decides how much pressure to give to the back brakes height sensing proportioning valve proportioning valve determines how much percentage of braking force goes from the back to the front now we got abs that kind of lessens the importance of that but that's what it did. You're going to see this on the rear end of trucks from, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. They might still be on there as far as I know, but that's what it does because we don't want the rear brakes to lock up because the bed of the truck's empty.
that's really, really dangerous. Okay, why would it lock up? Because there's no weight over the tires, so they just they go across it. There's not enough friction. Man, we got a lot to talk about in so little time. But the exciting thing is when we come back, I'm going to talk to you about analog brakes and traction control and how that how those two interact, which is a groovy lesson and it's a useful thing to know. Uh, as I said, Rudy said he's not going to be here tonight. Um, but shoot, I wish Dave and Burks were. Well, maybe they can, I mean, at least they can watch it later, right? Um, Chris Fix has a million videos on how to change oil and fluids and such like. He, he's got some stuff he doesn't know, but for the most part, you know, he, he's got, he's 95% there. It's actually a good one. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm gaining a new uh, appreciation of Scotty Kilmer. I mean, it is Yeah, I like him. Yeah. So, oh, the new the new guys I like are South Main Auto Repair. I know uh, I just found a really good one. Yeah. I, I yeah. got to find his name though. I'll do it on break. Yeah. Let's check it out. Um, <laughs> not super super Mario Diagnostics. So what's happening is we're moving to the next level, right? Because you start off at the beginner level, you know, like the Chris Fix, Eric, the car guy video. And we can we can feel ourselves pushing up to the next level, like South Main Auto Repair. He's a very sharp diagnostic guy. And he does a lot of demonstrations on like the Autel Ultra, which I hate to say I'm kind of getting some feelings for. I think we can duplicate most of what he's doing, but... Uh, not if they don't let us in the shop, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the good thing is we're getting the theoretical um, academic uh, lecture portion of the class out of the way. So we'll be raring to go. I don't know about you guys, but I, I got a ton of service that I need done on my vehicles the moment they let us back in the shop. So save up all your, you know, so we can get back there in force, right? And if you have anything you want me to teach you in the next three weeks, that's not, you know, six weeks long. If you have anything you want me to address for you in the next three weeks, as we finish out the semester, uh, be sure to let me know, hopefully in advance, but be sure to let me know, you know, my email address and whatnot. So okay, we can do that. Shop in January? Uh, to tell you the truth, nobody knows. And uh, I think it's I think it's one thousand percent dependent on the results of the election. It, it pains it freaking crushes me to say that. We're you there know, already, I think. Mm -mm. No, not San Bernardino County. The metrics say that we we won't be opening in January. I they mean, won't. in class. But I'll tell you one thing. You know, yesterday was Veterans Day, seven twenty nine. Yesterday was Veterans Day. Do you think all those beautiful, beautiful young people sacrificed their lives so that so that they could preserve a system like this? Nope. It's outrageous. Such it's such a disrespect. I mean, it's like why 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 are you laying a wreath? Why are you saluting the flag? Why why are you saying all these pretty words if you disrespect their sacrifices by yeah. doing this to America? Letting them die in vain. That's that's not right. Yeah. Right. So it is currently 7:30. I will see you at 7:45. Yeah. Big smiles yeah. on our faces. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. Appreciate uh, it. Yeah. There we go. All right. So. Cooling system pressure and die tests. D Y E. Cooling pressure, cooling system pressure and die test. Okay, why are we doing a die test on the uh, cooling system? To see if there's a leak. Yeah, I think that's probably correct. I don't know if they're referring to the block check test. Um, but yeah, uh, we use dies in, um, for instance, uh, air conditioning diagnosis. So if we have some kind of leak, which is extraordinarily common, if we have some kind of leak, we can uh, pick it up with, say, a ultraviolet a black light or uh, ultraviolet light, something like that. Black light, depending on, depending on the leak detection system you have. 
but that's kind of a specialized. I'm just saying the dye makes it easier to see. Yeah. So if it's a slow leak or a slight leak, you're not going to be so uh, powerless to identify it and its source. Um, cooling system pressure leaks. Well, we talked about the um, pressure caps. Did we talk? Did I show you the pressure caps video in this class? I don't think so. Okay, so let me do that. Go here. Go here. Sorry. Uh oh. Hmm. There we go. Let's try this. Hey, Joel, how are you, dude? Good to see you, man. All right, check it. discuss radiator caps. Here you'll see a typical radiator cap that attaches directly to the fill neck of the radiator. As you can see, there are several different styles of radiator caps. This what he's holding is the old school type of radiator cap. We used to have pressure caps on the radiator. Pressure cap is used so we can pressurize the cooling system so that the boiling point of the coolant is raised to like 257 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. Anyway, Modern cars tend to have pressure caps on the expansion tank now. We don't have them on the um, radiator anymore, but you're probably gonna see this, so let's get familiar with it. This is a locking radiator cap that includes a lever to safely release the pressure before removing the cap. These are coolant expansion tank caps. These fit on the expansion tank, which is located remotely from the radiator. Yeah, that's gonna be on the expansion tank. Look, the big difference is this is a pressure cap, which means if you open this while the engine's hot or the engine's running, it'll blast boiling water all over you. And I just need to remind you, that's how they get the skin off chickens. Um, so don't do that. Uh, as you can see, it says 15 PSI, that's a pressure cap, and that's gonna be found on the expansion tank. So just be aware of that. Don't be opening this when the engine is hot. These caps are on an older system that includes a coolant recovery tank. The coolant recovery tank is not pressurized. Newer cooling systems that use the expansion tank are pressurized as part of the cooling system. You may think a radiator cap is very simple, but there are actually several components within the cap. As you can see here, there's a gasket that seals to the radiator neck, not allowing coolant to escape to the atmosphere. That's the pressure gasket. There is also a gasket here that seals the inner lip of the radiator. There's also a spring and a valve that helps oh, control the pressure within the radiator. Cooling systems operate at a specific pressure. Make sure and purchase the correct pressure radiator cap for your vehicle. That's a hard thing to say. Look, here's the thing you need to remember about radiator caps. They've got a pressure valve and they've got a vacuum valve. Both need to be working perfectly. For instance, if you have a situation where your engine cools down and all the radiator hoses are collapsed, that's a sign your vacuum valve isn't working. Every time someone brings a car in, if the cooling system is cool enough, we're going to take off the radiator cap and, and more often than not, by a great majority of uh, instances, we're going to see a radiator cap that really ought to be replaced before it creates a problem. A lot of times when we take off a radiator cap, we can see that it's the first time it's been off in 10 or 15 years. So we can see it's all cracked and chewed up. So let's get another one. It's cheap, you know, eight, 10, 15 bucks. And the peace of mind it gives you is nothing short of amazing. All radiator caps have the pressure rating listed on the cap. This is a 16 pound cap, which means it will maintain 16 pounds of pressure inside the cooling system. Water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. At sea level. For every one pound of pressure in the cooling system, it raises the boiling point by three degrees. Fahrenheit. 
This 16 pound cap will raise the boiling point of the cooling system by 48 degrees. By increasing the engine coolant temperature, engine performance will be improved. To properly check the operation of a radiator cap, you should use a coolant system pressure tester. This cooling system tester will not only check the radiator cap, but will also check the entire cooling system for leaks. You'll so what they're gonna do is, this is gonna hook up to your radiator pressure cap, and you're gonna pump it, pump it, pump it, pump it, and make sure that the valve opens at uh, that it's rated pressure. Also, what you're going to do is you're going to put that on the radiator, uh, top of the radiator where the radiator cap goes, and then you pump up the pressure in the system and make sure that the system can maintain that pressure. If the pressure goes down, that tells you that you have a leak. You'll need to use the proper adapter for your radiator cap. Good luck with that because there's like 17 million different adapters. We have the setup with all the different adapters, fortunately, but um, if you just want to buy the basic kit and you think that's going to work for you, chances are that it won't. I believe you can probably rent this from any local auto parts place. Install the adapter onto the tester. Install the cap onto the adapter. After you pump up the tester, make sure the reading on a gauge matches the pressure rating on the radiator cap. The radiator cap is an important part of the cooling system, but oftentimes it is overlooked. It is always recommended to replace the radiator cap during any coolant system repair. Well, not by me. That Yeah, it's recommended by the guy that sells them. <laughs> the radiator cap should be part of your regular maintenance schedule. True. This will help extend the life of the cooling system. True. All right. So, um, something tells me that if I was to go in here and look for... Uh oh. Why is that guy killing his mother? That was a joke. Rorschach, <laughs> that joke. Okay, so. There you go. See, that'll show you how to do the block check. But I'm not going to watch it. I'm not going to show you. But there's a whole bunch of, as you can see, there's 98 videos on how to do it. So you can figure it out that way. I think that's a better use of our time. Oh, I got the name of that dude. It's um, Schroding, Schrodinger's Box. Oh, yeah. Really the one the diagnostics and stuff. Schrodinger, oh, that that's where, that's the thought exercise where there's a cat in the box and you can't tell whether it's alive or not. That's the name of the guy who does all the auto repair ones. They're really good. Schrodinger's box. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the cat thought so. Uh, <laughs> Advanced do-it-yourself auto repair? Yeah. Aw, yeah, see the cat's not happy about Hi, it. Hi, my name is Matt. Welcome. Well, his, his name's Matt. He's got to be all right. Okay, so I'll look into that. Geez, how'd you like figure them? that out? Yeah. That's kind of cool. That is kind of cool. Um, really into the diagnostic aspects, so. Isn't that amazing? No, he says you, a lot of stuff you say that a lot of mechanics don't know what the heck. If you ask them a question, they won't even know what it is. Right. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Because, well, it's like... <clears throat> The kind of people, okay, the, the people's conception of auto repair is so 60 years ago. It's like that it's greasy and manual labor, and that's, you know, yeah, that's what it maybe used to be a million years ago. Oh, okay. So let's go back here, and we are, have talked about pressure and die test to identify leaks check coolant condition and level okay so how are we going to check coolant uh, coolant level well if we have a system with an expansion tank it's going to have a hot or cold line on the side of the box maybe i should just show you box looks like this, this is an expansion tank it goes like this and it's going to say cold or hot or whatever how they want to do it and then you're going to have this pressurized cap right here that says, do not take me off while the engine's hot. 
that's an expansion tank. There we go. Look at the line. That will help you. Okay, so what are we using for coolant? Um, the propylene glycol stuff. Propylene well, it depends glycol? on what your car takes. Yeah, there's different propylene types. Propylene glycol. Now that's interesting because I'm thinking to myself, propylene glycol. Can you just pour that down the sink? No. Why not? Because it's uh, toxic. No, it's not. It's what they give you when you have a colonoscopy. They do. So, yeah. Got okay, it. are you telling me, I don't know how old you are, but are you telling me you haven't had a colonoscopy yet? Yeah, I've had three of them. Okay. <laughs> Remember I told you I did it without pain medication? Right. Wet awake? <laughs> bad idea, just for the record. Uh, yeah, bad idea, right? <laughs> yeah. So anyways, my point was, okay, yeah, I remember that conversation. Yeah, that's what yeah. they give you because um, your, your, your liver can't uh, um, metabolize it, but... It'll start cleaning you out. That's the truth. Okay, what am I thinking? Am I thinking of the wrong stuff or what? No, oh, you're talking about ethylene glycol. Yeah, you can't be pouring that down the sink. That's, yeah. that's toxic problems. Uh, there's something about that that I'm not going to tell you, but my sister does occupational safety and health, so there's something I know about that, but I'm not going to tell you because we're being recorded on a public venue. All right, so we talked about uh, checking coolant level. Now, here's the thing. If we have a radiator, so that's how you do it with the expansion tank. If I'm checking the coolant level on a radiator, old school, like a 68 Mustang, do I fill the radiator to the top? No. No. Why? Because when it gets hot, it expands. Yeah, right? So what it's going to do is it's going to puke all the fluid out. And you should definitely have an expansion tank that's minimum. You can't be dumping that crap all over the street. That's no good. So what's going to happen is when you look at your coolant level, it's going to probably look lower than you think it should be. But that's because it should have a, um, it's going to expand a lot. So how do you know? Well, as I say, most expansion tanks, say, for instance, if you had a 98 Mustang or something like that, the expansion tank is going to have a line on it that says hot and cold. Um, and uh, you want to check your level that way and just let the radiator take care of itself as long as your radiator cap is operating correctly. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, heater core. Oh, what do we know about the heater core? We talked about the heater core in this class, right? Mm -hmm. How it's in the dashboard? Yep how we must protect it at all costs and how are we protecting the heater core these days folks changing the air the changing the, the freaking coolant that's exactly it because the coolant turns acidic and the first thing it's going to go after is the heater core why because it knows that the heater core is the hardest thing to fix <laughs> i gotta tell you i think we i think we've discussed this before you know that silver radiator stop leak I'm not ashamed to say that I'm going to try that first before I try before I try to replace a heater core because I got to tell you, replacing a heater core like I had a 2000 Explorer, it's really easy to change the heater core on that. But most cars, it's a freaking nightmare. On a Mercedes, it's like an eight-hour job. So I'm going to try to avoid that as much as I can, you know. And people always talk bad about that silver uh, radiator stop leak stuff, but. As I say, GM requires you to use two little bottles of that anytime you have the intake manifold off. So, or at least they did. So I'm good with it. Just make sure that you read the instructions carefully and follow them to a T. All right. So that right there is that one. Inspect, replace, and adjust drive belts, tensioners, and pulleys. Okay. Let's make a drawing. Right here's a crank pulley. This is going to be this is going to be simplified, folks. A pulley is used any place you have a belt. So vehicles, engines these days are going to have what's called serpentine belts, which means it's going to have one belt that drives all the accessories with the same belt, or almost all of them, with the same belt. Uh, that's used because we started having so many engines transverse mounted that we couldn't have 
you know, my friend's got a 68 Mustang. We were looking at it last night and, you know, the, there's a belt that sticks out like six, eight, six inches in front of the engine. You can't have that on a transverse mounted engine where the engine is mounted sideways. So what they did is they've come up with a serpentine belt and that's what everybody's using now. Okay, so this is called the crank pulley and it's bolted to the front of the crankshaft and it spins at engine speed whenever the engine is turning. Okay, so let's say that that's 10 inches in circumference. Well, over here is the alternator pulley. Let's say that that's two inches in circumference. Circumference being the measure of a circle around, actually that's perimeter, no. Circumference if it's a circle. It's I don't know, this was 45 years ago for me. Now, so I'm gonna come in with my belt. And as I say, you know, I'm leaving out power steering and air conditioning, all kinds of stuff like that. I'm gonna come in here like that. And maybe I'm gonna to have to go like this to come over to another pulley. Maybe it's for air conditioning, maybe it's for power steering, I don't know. But it's got this thing right here called an idler. It's just a roller, it's got a bearing. Oh, sorry. It's just a roller, it's got a bearing. And then this is gonna come this way and then that way because right here, very much like the timing uh, belts that we've studied. Over here we're going to have a tensioner. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a very bare bones front of the engine looking towards the engine look of a typical belt um, setup. Now, all the idler does is it just sits there and rolls. It's primarily used for change of direction or something like that, or, or to get the belt out of the way of something that would interfere with it. So I, all the idler is going to do is it's going to roll. Do they ever go bad? Sure. Yeah. They either get grooves in the surface or the bearing goes bad on them? Sure. Uh, how are you going to know they're making noise? Well, because you hear a noise that's sounds like and it's uh, coming from that location. The tensioner is an extraordinarily common part to fail, but the tensioner is doing a big job because what it's doing is it's keeping this belt tight against all of these accessories. You know, we talked about how the power steering pump is putting out crazy amounts of pressure when the wheels, when the steering wheels turned all the way over or the alternator, the alternator's creating all kinds of resistance to the turning of this belt when it's putting out, you know, full amperage. So this tensioner very commonly fails. Um, and what does a tensioner do? Well, tension means tightness, like you have a tension headache, for instance, or here's the interesting thing, at tension, at tension. So when a student is paying attention you should be able to tell by their body language because they should be at tension, right? Isn't that interesting? Um, students don't like that observation, but it's true. Um, so if the tensioner goes bad, a lot of times it's going to be making noise, but a lot of times if the tensioner goes bad, it's not going to hold the belt tightly enough. It slips? Yeah, and the belt slips, right? So instant, for instance, when the tensioner went bad on the Z06, you know, a couple of months ago, what happened was they were commanding the alternator to do 100% charge and it was only coming up to like 12 and three quarter volts or something like that. It wouldn't do voltage because the belt was too loose. It got burned out when in, the alternator was trying to charge the battery with the loose battery cable. <whistles> That's a spicy meat bottle. So let me ask you a question. If this crankshaft is turning at 3000 RPM and it's got a 10 inch circumference, how fast is this alternator pulley spinning? 
with a two inch circumference? It should go like five times faster. Yep. So it's 15,000 RPM? So it's going 15,000 RPM, yeah. Because alternators, generators, all that stuff, it all works a lot better if you spin it faster. The speed of the cutting action is one of the things that determines how much voltage and current is created by a magnet moving across a conductor. That was a hard sentence to get out, but I did. Um, so, do you know how to inspect a belt? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I would not get a cheap, cheap belt, you know, because you figure a belt's gonna last, what, 10 years, 15 years? So get a good one, you know. One of the things we need to do is we need to put ourselves in a financial situation where we're not tempted to do bad things that will lead to heartache in the future. Because, you know, a belt like that breaks and now all of a sudden you've got no charging system, you got no water pump, it's bad. So being stuck at the side of the road, you're like, you know what? It's not worth the ten, $15 I saved. Um, Check pulley and belt alignment. Hmm. Okay, so what does that mean? Make sure that the belt's on there properly. It's not like off of where the pulley is. Right, so this is a top view. There we go. This is a top view. I got a pulley here and I got a pulley here. That's no good because now the belt is going to have to come this way, that's no good. That's out of alignment. Chuck, have you seen a vehicle that had this problem in the last 30 years? Yeah, me neither. That's why I don't want to spend too much time on it. Old school stuff, especially if it's been, you know, replaced engine by some hack. Yeah, that'll happen. A bent bracket, something like that. Very, very common to have, you know, alternators that, you know, they're, spo they're supposed to be, they're supposed to be aligned like this, but they're aligned like this instead, something like that. That's very, very common, especially when some hack is, has put in a new motor or a used motor, whatever. Um, very, very common, but that's going to cause problems. Uh, and you don't want it wearing out the bearings on something really expensive. So uh, it's going to cause noise. It's going to cause premature belt wear. Uh, could cause loss of function and uh, could wipe out the bearings on something really expensive. So that's something you want to address if that's an issue for you. Well, that's a P1. Remove, inspect, and replace thermostat and gasket or seal. Huh? Is this volume two? Or is this volume one? Ah, it's still volume one. You guys are slackers. There you go. Okay, thermostat. Pop quiz. Thermostat. Thermo means heat, stat means stay. <clears throat> or stay the same. Uh, what the thermostat does is it stays closed and blocks the exit to the radiator from the engine until the coolant is all the way warmed up. That's to give us quicker orange engine warm up. So it's a valve. Every valve does the same thing. It controls flow. So the thermostat is there to give us quick engine warm up. The number one item that is removed from cars needlessly, inappropriately, and shamefully is the thermostat because that's all people know about cooling systems and cooling system diagnosis is take out the thermostat, right? It's like throw it in rice, right? That's all they know about cell phones, right? Put it in rice, you know? It's like, oh, I got swimmers here. I can go jump in some rice. Um, all right, so the thermostat is there for quick engine warm up. How does it do it? So it blocks coolant from exiting the block
until it it never mind coolant is completely warmed up. Yeah. So until the thermostat opens, all that coolant is just going to circulate around the engine getting hotter and hotter. So you saw the coolant bypass. I think we did, we studied the cooling system. Okay, and then the thermostat's going to open and it's going to allow flow into the radiator. Okay, so let's talk about this for a moment. Make sure we understand how the system works because there's a bunch of extraordinarily powerful diagnostic tools that are just laying there that, again, if you ask 90% of the people that work within a five mile radius of my school as mechanics, as professional mechanics all day long, they won't know how to do this test. Look, the thermostat. On most cars, it empties into the upper radiator hose so that when the coolant gets hot, the coolant can go in the upper radiator hose, track through the radiator, and then get sucked back into the engine from the suction side of the water pump. Okay, fine. Huge, huge diagnostic right there. Because if the engine's first starting out and the engine's turned on and it's running, if I touch that upper, ra upper radiator hose, it should be hot. Nope. Thermostat's still closed. Should be oh, cool to the touch. Cool. Should be cool to the touch. And we should not feel any flow through it. If we feel th flow through it and it's hot water, that means some jacket, um, some uh, uh, misguided youth has taken out the thermostat. Extraordinarily common. Now, why do they keep changing the thermostat? Because it's A, it's all they know about cooling systems. It's the only thing, it's the only part that they know the name of because grandpa showed them how to do it on their tractor and it's right on top of the engine. So it's very quick and it's very easy to do. And it will almost never fix your cooling system. Almost never. Proper operation of the thermostat looks like this. You start the engine when it's cold. You feel the upper radiator hose should be cold. No flow through it. As the engine warms up, pretty soon the thermostat's going to open. And when the thermostat opens, now all of a sudden you're going to feel a slight trickle of coolant, hot coolant on the bottom of the hose, which is going to increase in volume and temperature as the thermostat opens further and stays open. Huge diagnostic test, and it's right there. I don't need to know if the thermostat works by taking the thermostat out and putting it in water. I don't need to do that. All I have to do is stand there and put my hand on the upper radiator hose and wait. Get it? Feel me? Yep. Now I can now I can hook up a cheap scan tool and find out the temperature, and that's going to tell me when the thermostat's opening uh, um, point is. But you know what? If I touch the upper radiator hose, if I'm having some kind of cooling problem, and I don't know what it is, if I touch the radiator hose and it's hot, the thermostat is opening. That's not the problem. Yeah. Get it? Mm -hmm. Now, the symptom when the thermostat doesn't open, rare, but it happens. The symptom when the thermostat doesn't open is the engine's going to be hot as hell, paint blistering off it, and the radiator's going to be cold. Right? Does that make sense? Yep, totally. Yeah. Now, on modern cars, we're going to have electronic thermostats so that we can precisely control the amount of uh, coolant going to the radiator anyways. But if we understand how the thermostat works, we can figure out quick, free diagnostic testing. I've never seen that described before anywhere either. Um, yeah, yeah. That saves a lot of time and money, right? Yeah, right, right. Because, you know, if the thermostat's not the problem, let's not get our hopes up. Or waste time. The problem really is. That's why, you know, if, if you're... If you're thinking of fixing your own car and you don't have a little scandalito, you're fooling yourself and you're wasting a whole lot of people's time. Yeah. Because, I mean, this is, you know, just stick it on data, hold the upper radiator hose, see when the, um, the upper radiator hose starts getting hot and see what temperature it is. And, you know, if, you, if you're serious, you're going to do what serious people do, right? You don't have to get a fancy scan tool for that. 
So that's my theory about thermostats. Now there are other places and there's other ways of doing the thermostat, blah, 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 that's fine. But for most cars, that's gonna be all you need to know. Um, do they leak? Yeah, what's the number one cause of leaks in the cooling system? Because we're gonna keep hammering on this point. Oh, when you don't change the, the, uh, the fluid. The, uh... When you don't change the freaking coolant, yeah. 98% of all the problems you're going to have with the cooling system are going to be caused by the fact that you're not changing the coolant. It's the same thing that happens when you don't change your brake fluid and it gets all that water in it. You're going to rust out your wheel cylinders, your calipers, and your master cylinder. It's like they'll all be killed for nothing for yeah. just because you didn't spend 60 bucks, 70 bucks, whatever, 120 bucks, whatever, 160 bucks. I don't know whatever it is, but you should do it. Yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> Okay, so replace thermostat and gasket seal. Now, here's the thing. Some of these thermostats are going to uh, seal with an O-ring. Some of these thermostats are going to seal with a gasket. Chuck, what are we using on them gaskets? Installing them dry still? Either Chuck is frozen or he's just acting like it. I've never had an issue. Oh. Yeah, you just froze. No, the I, I installed dry. No, I, I install them dry. I, of course, I use anti seeds on the threads for the bolts. Uh, yeah. I also look at, I also look at the surface to make sure it's not pitted if it's aluminum. Uh, if it's a uh, plastic uh, thermostat housing, I'm looking at that pretty close. If it's old, I'm thinking now oh, it's probably heat stress and that's going to crack over time. So there's a lot of variables. I mean, but for the majority of the time, I will lubricate the O-ring with the yeah. one of your tricks with this, the, what's that, synthetic? Uh, silicone spray? Silicone spray, and then I'll just oh. put that on there. Yeah, there you go. Okay, Chuck's brought something up that I wanted to, um, um, I wanted to uh, talk about. So let me see what I can do here. Come over here. And I'm just gonna use some weird uh, descriptor and see if I can get it, stone. On gasket surface. Uh oh. Oh yeah, that that too. I've done that. That trick you taught me is very good. I taught you that. Yep. Wow. I thought your time with me was completely wasted, but <laughs> that's, good. that's good to hear. All right. Let's see. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, Okay, peach parts, what the hell? Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. There's this thing called a stone. It's usually used for sharpening knives, stone. but it has the uh, advantage of being flat and it has the advantage of not being very coarse. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to come in with this stone, which is a piece of rock, abrasive rock about Oh, I don't know, nine inches long, two inches wide, and maybe an inch and a half thick. And I'm going to come over that surface and I'm going to make sure it's completely flat because a lot of times you'll put the stone over it and you'll say, oh man, I didn't realize it had this big chunk out of it. Um, also, if you use a file, people tend to round off the edges like this, which is disastrous. And, uh, don't use a freaking orbital sander or something like that. That's just disastrous. I like using the stone because it keeps everything flat. Wow, look at this guy. Yeah, let's do that. Um, well, he's not going to help us. So let me, sh let me just show you. So you can see what the issue is and what me and Chuck are going to be working on. And I'll just show you our can... Stone. Yeah, looks like that. I wouldn't use an Arkansas stone. You know what I love, which actually works really good because I'm always going to tell you when I've got um, something at Harbor Freight I love. I love their stones. It's got a coarse and it's got a fine and it's always the perfect whatever, you know, whatever your problem is. I wouldn't get an Arkansas, but if I put stone, it's going to be number 18 billion in search results. So. These are usually used to sharpen knives, which is a good idea too. So um, it's going to look like that. It's like 
five bucks at Harbor Freight. And what it's going to do is it's going to make it so that you're never tempted to do something stupid. And like Chuck, I'm going to do this on every gasket surface, every flat gasket surface I come across, because what it's going to do, this is a habit I got in 30 years ago, because what it's going to do is if something passes my eye test, it's going to show up on this if it's, if it's an issue and it's going to keep everything straight square and, uh, you know, don't rock it, just keep it flat. And that's, you know, for a whole lot of surfaces. I really, I really, really dig that. And it's worked fabulous for me, for me for the longest. And if you've got any corrosion or any leftover gasket material, this will pick it up. So. What's the difference between the Arkansas pocket and the translucent one? Uh, I don't know. Because you said uh, don't get the Arkansas one. Why? I would not get the Arkansas just because Arkansas, I think it's too, um, it's too, uh, it's too fine. Okay. Uh, let's see if this comes up first. Yeah, that one right there. Cool. Okay. That's what you need. Okay. Cheap. Cheap. And it's got a coarse and it's got a fine. So I really dig it. And you know, you only need one. Right. Just make sure you don't let any children touch it because they're dropping it and break it for sure. But yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where if you have it, you're always going to do the job right. Like the wire wheels that go on the uh, drill motors. If you have it, you're always going to do the job, job right. If you don't have it, you're going to be tempted and temptation goes before a fall. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And you know what's what's it worth to you to have a failure? Because I got to tell you, I've told you this before. You can do you can have ten thousand satisfied customers and no one will say a word, but you have one person that thinks that you've done them wrong, and they'll get out the phone book and start calling. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's not comebacks are just terrible. You know, and people that don't understand cars, they don't understand that. Oh well, these things happen. No, they just know that they're horribly inconvenienced. And for most people getting your car fixed is a traumatic event. Yeah, they're, they're, they're scared and they know they had a good chance of getting fleeced. So that's what I think. Okay, so that's changing the thermostat, changing the thermostat housing. Um, do I believe in changing thermostat temperatures? Rarely and only on older vehicles, uh, but in general, no, because one of the problems you're going to have, like for instance, on the 99 Suburban, somebody put a 160 thermostat in there. Okay, well, that's because people think they understand cooling systems, so they're going to put in a lower opening point thermostat. That was probably a valid, you know, modification for 50 years ago. But the problem is now with a 160 degree thermostat, the thermostat opens at 160 degrees, it's supposed to have a 195. Since it doesn't open at 195 anymore, since it's got the big radiator, it never gets to 195. So there's like three monitors that will never run. If the monitors never run, you ain't never passing smog. So, yeah, so I believe in, run, in running the factory specified thermostat. In fact, I remember people used to take the thermostat out on Fords and it used to throw a cord, I think it was a code 24, which was engine coolant temperature uh, out of range or something because the coolant temperature sensor was accurate, but it couldn't believe the software was not programmed for some jackass taking out the thermostat. So it just assumed that the sensor was bad. That's old, that's that's old K-O-E-R stuff. I mean, that's, I haven't thought about that in years. I mean, that's old, old stuff. So people take out thermostats all the time. It's relatively easy to catch if you know how the thermostat operates. Just start it off when it's cold, grab the upper radiator hose and see if you feel hot water. If you do, there's no thermostat. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they'll leave the thermostat in, but they'll take out the guts or something. You know, people do crazy stuff because you know they don't have time to watch a YouTube video on how the cooling system works. So they just start monkeying with the thermostat. You know, like. I don't like see it. how you could do a good job if you don't have an understanding of how the systems yeah. work. Yeah, you can't, you can't, but you know. So they just so, do it procedurally, like if it's a procedure or? But just hacking away at it, you know, cause you know, they, they come from, you know, this this background where, you know, du dudes are supposed to know about cars. So they're like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. Okay. 
Right. That, I mean, that's half, that's half the cars that come into our shop is other people's mistakes. Oh, I bet. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're supposed to know how to change a tire. Yeah, I do, but it comes in with a lug nuts reverse or something. Yeah. Um, okay, so inspect and test coolant. Same thing. Visual is going to be my primary. You can also use a pH tester on the coolant. Um, I thought we already did that. Well, not really. Okay, in test, inspect and test coolant. Drain and recover coolant. Now, here's the thing. Like I said, there's a petcock on the bottom of the radiator that will drain the radiator out, but it won't drain the engine out. So if that's all you use, you're gonna leave a bunch of old coolant in the engine and that's gonna mix with your new coolant and it will you know, basically dilute it 50-50. The correct way to do this is to get it flushed. It's gonna be more expensive, but look folks, I would assume you're only gonna do it every 10 years. You're supposed to do it every five, but nobody does except the people that have expensive cars that they wanna preserve. While we're on that topic, I should probably change the coin in the Z06. Let me borrow some money, Chuck. Hmm? I'll pay you next Tuesday. I'll glad, uh, glad you paid <laughs> Tuesday for the coin flush today. All right. Um, but I mean, look at the stakes, right? Because if your coin turns acidic, it's going to start eating at your freeze plugs and stuff like that. That's bad. That's That turns into bad. Yeah, can you imagine having a truck with a four, a four wheel drive truck and the freeze plugs go bad? Good luck. Good luck, buddy. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the correct way to do it is flush. That that needs to be carted away by uh, actual uh, recycling company. Sure as hell, don't pour it in the drain. Um, refill, flush, and refill cooling system were recommended coolant. That's one of the tools I was hoping to get this year, but there's no way we're going to have money. Um, bleed air is required. Ah, so this is the important thing we have to talk about. Bleeding the air out of the cooling system. Well, purgando, right, is how we would say it in Spanish. What does purgando mean? Purgando means to remove what is unwanted, like the purge, mm -hmm. like binge and purge. Purgando. Okay, so when we're purgando los frenos, we're bleeding the brakes, right? We're getting the air out of the brakes. Well, you also have to do this on many cooling systems because the radiator cap is not the highest point in the cooling system. That's a problem because back in the olden days when we, the radiator cap was the highest point in the cooling system, all the, all the air would just get out of the system on its own. But now on many cars, that's not the case. So what you have to do is you have to bleed the cooling system to get the air out of it. And folks, if you don't get the air out of this cooling system, you're going to have big problems because the air bubbles will stay there. It's like uh, it's like if you have a, a double trap in your um, in your drain system, it'll completely stop the flow coming out, and it'll do that in your cooling system too, and that'll make you very very sad. Or if the cooling temperature sensor is in an air bubble, it's not going to transmit accurate temperature readings, which is going to make your engine run screwy and probably significantly damage it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say. Coolant bleeder valve. How about engine coolant? Well, looks like uh, thermostat housings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how are you going to know if you need to bleed the coolant? Well, if you see something like this where it's got a big old bleeder valve on the top, that's a hint. Yeah? Here's a Honda thing. Engine surging after timing belt job with no codes. Mm. OBD1 or primitive OBD2 or just freaking Honda. Um, yeah, so it's got a bleeder valve to get the air out of the system. Because if the air doesn't get out of the system, you're not gonna get the coolant flow you want. I really don't like this drawing, but I like something better. So I'm gonna come over here. Well, these are all thermostat housings. As you can see, many of your vehicles are using this because some part on the engine is higher than the radiator outlet. I mean, the, where the radiator cap goes. So you're gonna see a bleeder valve on top of the engine. That's there for a reason. 
So if you have any issues with the coolant, in fact, for me, a lot of times if I get a motor or a vehicle that just came into the shop, a lot of times I'm going to want to open up this valve just in case because it can cause all kinds of screwy um, symptoms like engine systems, cooling problems, all kinds of weird stuff like, like they say, engine surging, which is the engine going wow, 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 wow. So here's what you have to be careful about this um, bleeder valve though. Don't strip that. Don't strip that. You'd be sure to use flare nut wrench, or if it was me, I would use a box end on that if I could, if I could make it fit. And I sure as hell would not use my cheap tools on that because that's going to be a soft valve, just like uh, just like it is on the brakes. It's a soft valve to make sure it doesn't leak. And the problem is on the cooling system. A lot of people don't understand this question about bleeding uh, cooling systems. So a lot of times that valve won't have been moved for like 15 years. And if you're not careful, you're gonna strip that thing or break it off or do a million bad things that you don't wanna do. So I might come in there. In fact, I, I'm gonna suggest before you loosen up that valve, come in there with some uh, penetrating spray, get in there and just, you know, increase the odds in your favor, you know, like liquid wrench or whatever, just increase the odds in your favor what do we use? PB blaster. That's what we use. And I would probably come in here with a socket, maybe if I could get away with it. Just crack it open just a little bit. Now, with the engine on and the engine off, I believe it's engine on. Right. You're not going to take the freaking valve off because it'll be shooting, you know, 10 feet in the air. You just crack it just a little bit and you should see a little fluid coming out the tip right because we're going to be we're going to be scared about this the proper way to do this at least on most vehicles is engine cold you open up this valve to make sure that it's going to open when the engine warms up and then you close the valve start the engine as the engine starts to get warmer and warmer then you're going to open up this valve and you should see a bunch of air come out just like uh just like your brake system i'm probably going to squeeze the hose a couple of times just to see if i can shake any air bubbles loose and then when it starts pouring coolant pretty regularly, you can pretty much uh, be con um, convinced that you've gotten most of the air out of the system. Well, hopefully all of the air out of the system. That's how you do it, folks. Um, these are much nicer units than I'm used to. Well, here, here's the thing. That's the thermostat right here. Let me show you what I was talking about. <laughs> Great, it got smaller. That's the thermostat housing. Thermostat goes in there. Uh, this probably goes to the uh, heater core. That's the bleeder valve right there. But this thing right here is the engine coolant temperature sensor. So if you've got a big air pocket right here, this thing is going to be reading wacky because air does not transmit heat well. It's an insulator for the most part. So that's why we need to make sure that this thing is bled. As you can see, it's on the top of the system. We need to make sure that this thing is bled so that this thing is submerged in coolant so the coolant temperature works correctly. Because remember, not only is the coolant temperature the queen of all the sensors in terms of electronic energy control, but it's the thing that it's the signal that the computer uses to turn on the fans. So if this thing is reading whack, your fans are not going to turn on at the right time, which means your engine's at risk. Yeah, There's yeah. a lot of people that have blown engines by not doing this correctly, changing the thermostat and not bleeding the cooling system. This is why, you know, if you can find a good honest mechanic, you should probably stick to them like glue, unless you're going to do all this stuff yourself. You should probably stick to them like glue because the simple fact of the matter is there's a whole lot of ways to destroy an engine trying to save 15 bucks. Yeah, apparently. I mean, there's a lot of ways to destroy an engine, but only one way to maintain it. That's kind of deep. All right, so it says bleed air is required. That's a P1. That means priority one. That means you need to be able to do that for, you need to do that for sure. Now, like I said, if you want to do this in your driveway, you want to do this at home, you want to do this on, you know, friend's car, whatever, um, I'm absolutely uh, okay with, you know, signing off on that. Um, especially in these, you know, troubled times when we can't work in the shop.
Um, it shouldn't be hard to find a, a vehicle that has a cooling system uh, bleeder valve. All right, all right, transmission, we already did that. Okay, how do you check fluid level on a transmission that doesn't have a dipstick? Follow the instructions. On a lot of these, you just keep adding fluid and then it starts to dump out. So you just gotta be careful. You gotta pull out an access hole. So rather than give you specific instructions on that, I just say follow the instructions. Um, it's it's not it's certainly much more unwieldy. Like for instance, in the transaxle and a Corvette, there's no place to put a dipstick. So that's why they do it that way. These other manufacturers are doing it the way they do it. I think primarily just to make it so you want to go to the dealership to get your car serviced instead of trying to do it yourself. It's a it's a minor inconvenience, I think. Not crushing. I heard like some car dealerships make more money off the re repairs than they do the cars. Well, they have to because sales, you don't make money off sales because now everybody, everybody's so competitive, right? Yeah. Everybody's shopping online for cars, you know, so you ain't going to make money on sales. That's true. You got to come in and get their service, get their service on. Um, oh my God. Inspect, adjust, and replace external manual valve shift linkage, transmission range sensor switch, and park neutral position switch. Boy, that doesn't seem entry level to me, Chuck. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because that, I mean, that, that involves an adjustment, right? And if you got that adjustment a little bit off and it wasn't really in one gear, it was in two gears at the same time, you burn up that trans really easy. Mm -hmm. Okay, let, let, let me put it this way. We should be able to come in there and do a visual inspection of high quality. Visual inspection meaning all the linkage is in good shape and all the components are in good shape. But I don't want, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want someone entry level doing that adjustment. I don't think that's, I don't, that doesn't seem like entry level work to me. And there's so much at stake. Um, and it doesn't look like I'm going to get to traction control tonight, but remind me, we'll do that to, uh, next time. Describe the operational characteristics of a continuously variable transmission. This is easy. Well, it works really good for a while, but then when it gets to a couple, you know, 60, 80,000 miles, then it takes a dump and you're going to be in big trouble. Avoid, yeah. Pass, hard pass, swipe right. I don't even know, Is it swipe right, accept or uh, reject. Uh, yeah. uh, let's go like this. Okay, inspect for leakage at external seals, gaskets, and bushings. Yeah, now I made the point two, two weeks ago that one of the problems people have is that there's a shaft and there's a seal and the seal's leaking and people say, well, I'll just replace the seal. Problem is every shaft is gonna have bearings or bushings that are gonna locate it and support it. And if the bushing and bearing have lost their ability to locate the shaft, you put a new seal on it, it's just gonna to start to leak. So look behind every seal and see if there isn't a bushing or bearing that needs to be replaced. That can be very frustrating on like stuff like axle seals. Can be very frustrating because you put in all new brakes and then you know 3,000 miles later they're all soaked with the uh, axle oil again. All right drain and replace fluid and filters. Well we already talked about that a couple of weeks ago either three or four weeks ago. Here's the important thing inspect powertrain mounts. What does that mean? Well, every transmission has mounts, every engine has mounts, and it's very important that the movement limits of engine transmission and other driveline components are not exceeded. So how are you gonna know if the mount's bad? Check it. Thump, thump when you put it in gear. Yeah, I like the visual inspection. Thump when you put it in gear. Uh, a whole lot of engine movement, say for instance, if you were to, um, if, if you were to have a friend get in the car, step on the brakes really hard, put it in gear, and maybe, yeah, if the motor mount's bad, it's gonna be going like this, and or step on the gas, and then you'll really see movement. Uh, there tend to be, depending on the manufacturer, there tend to be upper mounts, and there tend to be lower mounts. The upper mounts tend to be really easy to fix. The upper mounts tend to be a bear now, Let's remember, the enemies of rubber are 
heat and oil. So what happens very, very commonly is somebody gets a power steering leak, bad hose, something like that, and it starts dumping fluid. And they're like, well, you know, I can just keep uh, refilling the reservoir, which is true. But the problem is all that hot, dirty oil goes after your engine or transmission mounts. And a lot of those are very painful to change. Chuck, were you, were you here when we changed the bottom mounts and something? And it was I just remember that one brutal yeah i was brutal yeah it was <laughs> and the worst part was most of those mounts didn't need to be changed i mean there i'm a believer that if the mount doesn't need to be if, if on a bottom mount I, well first of all i'm a believer that if a part doesn't need to be changed you shouldn't change it now is there a prophylactic uh, benefit to changing some things before they become an issue you know you look at it and you say well it's cracked it's going to be a problem sometime soon yeah, I, I agree with that, but just changing stuff for the fun of changing stuff, no, 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 no. I mean, I have a, a student in this class who disagrees with me on this point, but um, we, got, we, we, got, we got in big trouble with that, with that job. And, it, it, you know, we were changing mounts that were perfectly fine anyway, so it's like, okay, so why are we spending hours on this? How do you check a mount? Well, what's a motor, what's a motor or transmission mount supposed to do? Holds it in place. Yeah, yeah, it's supposed to hold it in place. Now, not rigidly though, right. because what it's supposed to do is it's it's a it's a sandwich of a piece of steel, a piece of rubber, and a piece of steel. The pieces this piece of steel mounts to the frame. This piece of steel mounts to the engine or the transmission. And it's got rubber in the middle. It's supposed to isolate vibrations. Okay, so and it locates the engine and transmission sure so if it's bad it needs to be replaced before it starts taking out a whole bunch of other components what's the number one killer of engine and transmission mounts sure as hell ain't excessive horsepower it's heat, and oil. heat right? yeah heat and oil so like i said this thing about allowing leaks to just go on is a loser idea it's a loser idea you know Get it fixed, get this stuff fixed. Besides, usually it's like stuff on your steering system or stuff like that. It's not stuff you don't want working correctly. Right. How do you check it for movement? Well, me and Chuck will probably come up with a really big pry bar. Yeah. And we'll start, we'll start pushing stuff to see if it moves. A lot of times it's merely sufficient to just uh, have someone get in and start the engine with the foot on the brake and put it in gear. And you'll see the engine just flop, and that's usually sufficient. Uh, upper radar, upper uh, motor mounts tend to be very easy to just do a visual inspection. And it's like a 10 minute job, and it really makes a significant difference, improvement, I should say. So that's my theory on motor mounts. You got any, uh, you got any more philosophy on that, Chuck? I have a question. Uh, I, I remember that student came in with that mount just. Uh, just said, hey, I want to just change it. So there was no real uh, inspection on that one. It was just, I got the part, put it in. So okay. we had nothing to really do with that one. <laughs> right. What, Michelle? What's going uh, on? Hey, say, you remember how I had the wreck and pinion was leaking, right? For quite uh, a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the, my car's making that thump thing you just described. Do you think that could affect the motor mount? I turned that on thump. the thump. It's the thump, yeah. Yeah, you're saying. Uh, you got to quit listening to uh um. You got to quit listening to uh um, tone loke. Um. <laughs> I wish we could get in and get a, everything on a lift, you know, because yeah, it's hard stuff to diagnose over the over the internet. Yeah, I understand. Uh, it could be. I mean, it certainly could be. Yeah. Um. So here's the thing: you got a big pry bar that gives you a lot of leverage. You just got to make sure you're not prying on anything that's going to get damaged. Um, now, polyurethane mounts. I did put polyurethane mounts in the Cobra because the engine was so insanely powerful and it was had a couple of issues anyway. But in terms of putting polyurethane mounts in a regular car, remember the whole point of the mounts being rubber is to isolate the vibration of the engine from the car. You don't want to make yourself unhappy by um, reducing that isolation and then increasing vibration. I've actually had solid motor mounts on 
cars before that I used to race, and it was noticeable in the passenger compartment. The vibration gets transmitted very well. In fact, noise vibration and harshness is actually a job title now. It's a big issue for um, for dealerships and stuff like that. Noise vibration and harshness. Now they got all these analyzers to find out the fre frequency of noises. So they can tell you whether it's a water pump bearing or a freaking alternator bushing or a, you know, belter. It's crazy. It's crazy. I've seen big old books on just NVH. It's called NVH. In fact, I believe that Diag.net was having a, a webinar on NVH this week or last week. It's worth checking out. D-I-A-G.net. Shout out Scott Brown. Free Z06. Yeah, I've, I've never gotten anything free from anything except cupcakes from Michelle. Um, so we're, and it made every it made it made me cool with everything, every other aspect of my life. Um, yeah. I'm thinking that I'm kind of happy with that. Describe the operational characteristics of a hybrid vehicle drivetrain. There's a couple of them, and I'm not sure that that's something we should be covering. Um, well, let me do this. Clutch. Clutch. Clutch master cylinder. What does a master cylinder do? Master cylinder controls a slave cylinder. Most of your clutches these days are going to be hydraulic clutches meaning that it's going to have a clutch master cylinder and it's going to have a slave cylinder instead of a caliper activating the clutch. Okay, well, all of the rules that apply to all hydraulic systems are going to apply to that system. Number one, you got to get the air out of it. Number two, you got to change the fluid. Now, what you got to watch out for is I recently found out that the... Um, The Corvette takes a special clutch fluid. It doesn't just take brake fluid. So you got to be careful about that. Make sure you get the right uh, chemicals. But they need to be bled like anything else. In fact, I have a video on how to bleed a new clutch master cylinder on a, no, it's not a new clutch master cylinder. It was a new uh, throw out bearing on a uh, Mustang. 2014, I think, Mustang. That's a hard one to do because it gets air trapped in it and then it doesn't work right. So that might be one of my most highly uh, watched videos because so many people are having problems with it. Um, <clears throat> Is that the clutch that has the, the sleigh cylinders built in with the throw off? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has a quick release. With hydraulic lines? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen those before. Yeah, don't break that little plastic clip that holds it in the trans. You'd be very, very sad. I know I was. Um, differential housing fluid. It, it might be ATF. It probably isn't. Differentials are under a lot of pressure. So same rules apply. If there's a gasket, I know what I like to use for gaskets. I like that Permatex 2B. I put it on pretty much everything and I've never had a failure. So, well, the only time you have a failure is when you put it on something thinking that it's gonna have some super magic properties and it doesn't. It's just a sealer that takes up space, but it does a great job and it doesn't get hard, which is a beautiful thing for what we need it to accomplish. Um, the same, what, what we end up seeing is that we try stuff and it works and we become familiar, uh, habitated, habituated and um, very um, proprietary about the methods we use. I mean, I like my Permatex 2B, I like the methods I use and I like the um, results I get. So. I'm very, very loyal to the chemicals I use and the processes I use to get the results I want, you know, and I'm, and I'm always, I always have an open ear to, to hear what other people are using and having success with, because after all, 
if I can if I can get success with my ear instead of having to trial and error, that's way that's big medicine, man. And if I can, you know, if I can, uh, if we can trade hot tips, I mean, that's groovy. I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about the YouTube and on um, the internet in general is that there's so much stuff that's like why is this not in the service manual but it's not and if you don't know this you ain't gonna get it like all kinds of there's all kinds of stuff in fact it's a huge controversy in this industry now there's all kinds of stuff where some dudes figured out a way to do a four-hour job in like an hour and he's figured out a way where it just barely fit like a heater correlate just barely fit out you don't have to take the dash out just barely fit and it's like man that's big medicine man and have you ever read the book the four hour work week no yeah i read it like a while ago but it's a good book i remember <laughs> it sounds exhausting the, um it's mostly about saying no to stuff you know just to do the really important stuff right and just uh, delegating other stuff and just right. saying no for what is not important actually oh, i got no problem with that My <laughs> point, the, the what's happening you know in the industry is you know, if you look up the labor guide for, you know, writing out an estimate, it says, you know, this job takes four hours. Well, then the person goes on YouTube and they see this dude that got it done in an hour and he comes back and says, why did you charge me for four hours? This guy got it done in one hour. The question is, what's the proper price? What's the proper price? And, you know, because the customer is not going to be happy if they're paying for four hours and you can get it done in an hour. I mean, that's the big problem with flat rate and the way that pricing is done with the Automotive Repair Act in the state of California. You have to give people a signed, written, itemized estimate. So you have to get labor guide from somewhere called the flat rate manual, parts, labor and parts estimator. So that's the big question if we find some secret tip that makes it much faster to do a diagnostic or much faster to do a repair or a service what's the correct price you know that's that's a, that's a hard question to answer is because i got to tell you the way automotive service goes is every once in a while you come up with a, a trick or you invent a special tool or something like that so that you can get a job done way faster than um, than the parts and labor estimator uh, will give you. The problem is every once in a while, you got a job that's gonna take twice as long. And theoretically and hopefully that's supposed to even out so that you can, uh, so you can make a decent living. Cause it's in all of our benefits to keep good mechanics working in this industry. They got to be paid well. And if you look at like South, if you look at South Main Auto Repair, or or Scanner Danner, or people like that, these people are freaking hardcore, and they're spending tons of money on equipment. And we need to make sure that they stay in the industry. We have to keep these technicians motivated with money, right? Because it, the skill level is insane. The in, skill level is insanely high. These guys that are general mechanics and they work on all different kinds of vehicles. I don't know how they freaking do it. I don't know how they do it. I mean, Doesn't what I was doing, do. yeah, I was doing the same transmission over and over again. I mean, that was, that was bad enough, but they're doing different vehicles, different parts of different vehicles all the time. And it's like, man, the skill level it takes to cut off. Yeah. So we need to keep these technicians highly motivated, you know, and you look at the, you look at the kind of work they're doing. It's like, you know, that's a hundred grand a year worth of value. If they're not making a hundred grand a year, they're going to go do something else that pays better. So we need to keep them highly motivated. And for some of us, we need to start thinking about how can we become that kind of person? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It starts with going to school. It starts with bowing your head and saying, you know what, what I'm doing is not good enough. I'm making too many mistakes. I don't understand the systems well enough. I need to go sit in a chair and do something that I have a real distaste for, which is sit in the classroom, learn some stuff. Yeah. And sure enough, got me a soft job. You know, it, it works. I mean, it's, I, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to prosper. Otherwise, you know, we're doing continuing education, just like nurses are doing continuing education. 
It's just the model of this profession does not look people people understand continuing education for healthcare workers, but they don't understand continuing education for freaking automotive technicians. Look, the body hasn't changed in 40,000 generations, but the cars keep changing all the time. Uh, a lot of stuff changes, though, on medical on uh, regular basis. Sure. The medications, yeah. the, a lot of stuff. Sure, sure. But the body stays the same. Um, and the same thing is true. I'm just saying the same thing is true with technicians, right? right. The shops that are smart, like Tony and Dick, the shops that are smart, they're saying, you know, this continuing, continuing education is part of your job description, right? Yeah, it's got to be. Sure. It's got to be. Yeah. yeah. And so does me. I have to do continuing education all the time. Right. I do 50, okay, 45 on real estate and eight on mortgage. So it's 53 hours a year. Yeah. You have to up with it, you know? Do you find that that's sufficient or do you have to go over and above? A lot of it not because it's just uh, the same stuff over and over in right. some ways. Right. But right. just some new regulations here and there. With right. But you're gonna have to, but you have to do stuff like okay, so uh, asbestos abatement stuff like that. But you know what I do instead of doing the old stuff, I just uh, sometimes you can you can basically do a little bit different stuff, which is a certification, and the certification hours will go towards your general towards your continuing education. Okay. So I just get certifications okay. all the time, and yep. they go towards my general uh, to my, towards my uh, like continuing education. Well, you know it's funny because. Um, my sister is in occupational safety and health, mm -hmm. and she works at a, at a certain famous employer up in Redmond, Washington. And it turns out that she was the only person on the whole freaking campus with you know 30,000 people, whatever. She was the only person in the whole freaking industry, not the industry, the whole company that was certified for uh, um, virus uh, handling, um, you know, uh, abatement. Well, this probably wasn't in use. And this time, it's a good time. Yeah, it was a good time. Good time right? <laughs> it's a hot topic right now. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, but folks, it's been great. Um, I don't know where everyone was, but they missed a treat. It'll be up on YouTube uh, presently. You know how slow my uploads are now. But um, if you want to study something uh, that's not on just on this list. Um, we only have three weeks left, so let's get after it because I would like to, I would like to, I'm hoping and praying, you know, we'll see if we get a whole bunch of new students or something like that, but I'm hoping and praying to make uh, next semester uh, my yeah. electrical tour to force because it's been waiting. Can we and, do like a troubleshooting one? Yeah, sure. But yeah. the troubleshooting has to come after the understanding of the fundamentals, right? So, of course, yeah. Yeah. So that's exciting. That's exciting. Um, that's not going to be anything any other adult school is going to be even coming close to. So hopefully things will work out, you know. Yeah. yeah you can get into free stuff any day, I think. Yeah. Watch, <laughs> watch in your email for uh, um, announcements of registration for next semester. Be sure to get in there because I don't know if people are smart. If people were smart, they would be flooding distance learning right now to learn a bunch of stuff. But people tend to not be smart. And as a result, they're sitting around saying, well, I'm not going to go back to school until, you know, the, um, until we can go back in person. I think that's a, I think that's a mistake. Yeah. But the return on the investment is really good, you know, for like so little bit of money, right. you study so much just for right. fun, just for your, your own good, you know? Right. I mean, it's like you could go to Sycamore Inn and spend what you pay for a semester at this place. <laughs> totally. Easily. <laughs> Yeah, probably yeah, it's really good the return on investment. Yeah, probably but, more delicious yeah. as well. Quack. Yeah. All right, guys, appreciate it. Have a great day. Uh, but week. you know, man, just one second. I, I you know, uh, I was saying uh, this Saturday, but uh, I'm doing a thing. It's called the uh, Friendsgiving. I like invited the random people, random neighbors that I don't know. So if you guys want, I can uh, put my address. I invited totally random people. It's gonna be on my in my driveway. Just I'm gonna have wine and food so people can just come and meet other people. Just so, just yeah, so something because okay, I'm gonna come here, I'm gonna come right here, and then I'm gonna say <coughs> app online, something app. 
There we go, like that. ASC renewal. Yeah. So what it does is, since they don't want you going to the testing center, what they'll do is they send you a, a, a question every day. Let me see. That's not it. D R. I think you spelled your name wrong. Oh no. Nope. Never mind. Fine. Now I get it. That's gonna be easy. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Well drill cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, look. Okay, so this is what it is. It's got all the questions for master certification. If you get eight questions, answer eight questions correctly then they will extend your certification so you don't have to go into a testing center. Now, I would love to show you what questions they're asking, but that would be a huge violation and probably a felony. So that's, you do. <clears throat> that's what it looks like. So every once in a while, see, they're going to send me my next question Saturday, November 28th. This one, they'll send me the next one Thursday, November 19th. So it's just continuous. And what I found with this is it's very, it's way more hardcore than the re regular um, testing. It's much more up to date than the regular testing. So anyway, it just, I'm just trying it. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times if you miss an answer, they will give you resources to study up on stuff, which is freaking awesome for me. Because, yeah. you know, I don't see that many, I don't see that many cars, especially in the last six months. I don't see that many cars. So um, I don't see a whole bunch of different technologies from a whole bunch of different manufacturers. So um, that is how they're doing that now. Let me take a picture. <laughs> Let me see. Come on now. You just have to just enter your email to sign up. Uh, I think it costs 45 bucks a year or something. Okay. But I think that's for renewal. If you are, you got to already have the certifications, but I'm not sure. That's just, that's what the industry is doing. That's what their answer is. Cause again, who knows when we'll get back to normal. Man, I sure missed an electro program. Oh, man, that was yeah. awesome stuff, man. That was okay. I'll get it to you. I'll get it to you. Yeah. Do I have your email address? Tell you what, shoot me your email address in the um, comment on the chat right now. And that will be easier and better for me. I'll try to get to you tonight. Yeah. Sorry about that. Why is it doing this? Okay. There we go. There you go. Cool, man. All right, folks, I'm going to stop recording. Didn't hear anything. Oh, yes, I want to stop recording.